I'm um, thrilled to introduce Paul Griffiths, CEO of Dubai Airports. I'm going to be talking to him for this keynote interview about Dubai Airports Future Unpacked. Paul Griffiths. <laughs> You want to take the seat on the that side? Yeah. This one over here. Yeah. Okay, Paul, thank you so much. It's great to have you here and great to be talking to you in amongst uh, so many colleagues and friends. Um, I suppose uh, my first question after hearing wh what the trends are, especially from this region, is the pandemic rebound. How is that going for Dubai airports? Well, we were very fortunate indeed to have completely recovered by the first half of last year. And we posted 87 million passengers by the end of 2023, which is the largest number since before the pandemic. And um, I attribute this to several things. First of all, during the pandemic, I think the Dubai government made some excellent moves to reassure travelers that the city was safe had excellent medical care. And secondly, we didn't do what a lot of other airports did. We didn't retrench thousands of employees that we couldn't then get back. We were ready to go uh, like a coiled spring because we knew the recovery was going to be very, very rapid. We didn't know when it was going to happen, but we needed to be ready. And it was a strategic decision not to furlough thousands of employees so we could be ready. And of course, we're quite unique really and quite fortunate that we can draw our employee base from across the world. So some markets where it was difficult to mobilize employees, we were able to then go to other markets to source the right people, train them, and then they were ready. And fortunately, the, when the recovery came, we didn't have any capacity or service issues and we were able to uh, coordinate and prepare for the growth that, that actually came. So, uh, I mean, that's great that you didn't have to retrench so many people, but how did you manage financially during that time? Well, what we did is we did some fairly innovative things. We found a service partner and we changed our frontline business model. Instead of employing the majority of our frontline service people directly, we found a service partner who trained and developed people and recruited them to our standards and then said we would remunerate them based on the customer service uh, outcomes that those people delivered. And it's proved very successful because they've taken all of the employment headache uh, and provided a very highly motivated and trained workforce which have, who performed excellently. So actually thinking afresh about the supply chain helped us transform our cost base, give us a more um, flexible employee base and a more highly motivated workforce. So it's, it's been a real win-win-win for supplier, customers and uh, the airport authority as well. Yeah, I mean, we've, we're seeing that investment during the pandemic really play out now and mm. people getting returns. Um, even anecdotally though, after the pandemic, it felt like everyone was traveling to Dubai, through Dubai, I mean, uh, why is that? And have you managed to keep the momentum up given the global headwinds? Well, most definitely. I think the Dubai government, again, did an excellent job promoting the city. We had more than 17 million visitors last year, which is again, a new record. And, and I think the thing is the city managed to position itself as a safe and attractive destination during the pandemic. And that's endured actually post pandemic. The other interesting thing is that we were predominantly a transfer airport pre-pandemic. Something like 60% of total traffic was in transit to other destinations and 40% was actually visiting the city. That's actually flipped and we're now 60% point to point to and from the city and 40% in transit. We see it coming back to a more or less equal split between the two, but that's been a very positive thing for us because of course the economic multiplier of visitors to the city is so much stronger than those that are in transit at the airport for just a few hours. So that's been another phenomenon. And what lies in the immediate future for Dubai airports? Well, first of all, we are a land-constrained airport. 
we do not have the ability to expand on any four sides. So we have to use our infrastructure more and more effectively. And we've done this through training our people, motivating our st stakeholders to be really focused on the customer experience and also investing incredibly heavily in the technology to both speed the journey through the airport and also to make absolutely sure that there are uh, uh, no bottlenecks. So we measure absolutely every single thing that moves on the airport to optimize the efficiency of it. And um, that I think seems to be the way because that way you save a huge amount of money because you avoid the huge capital cost and the, the huge difficulties with infrastructure expansion. Uh, the technology deployment is, is much more cost effective than building things. And of course you get happier customers because you know, we, we, there's only two places in the world that you queue and that's the post office and the airport. And we want to hand the monopoly back to the post office on queuing so that everyone just goes through. And we have this thing called no red lights policy where we don't um, want our customers to stop unless they want to. So not being held up at check-in, not being held up at immigration, not being held up at security. So those processes are fairly slick. And of course, the big benefit, if you can halve the dwell time at those pinch points, you double the capacity without building anything. And of course, if you're respecting people's time and handing that time back to your customer, they A, should be happy, and secondly, hopefully have more time to browse and shop and dine, which is something obviously from which we make a commercial return. So everyone wins with that strategy. Yeah, I, I've been caught in one of those queues at Dubai Airport many years ago mostly because of the migrant labor coming um, back to Asia, actually. So you talked about land, you talked about technology, and what are your other big challenges? Well, some of the big challenges we've got for the future are clearly what happens when we've exhausted all of the technology. We've got some way to go because it's quite incredible when you turn your mind to it, how much latent capacity there is. And I think the big problem in airports is that too many people running airports think they're in the infrastructure business. We're actually in the hospitality business. And if we micromanage the passenger journey from the passenger's perspective, it's incredible how much capacity you can release. But ultimately, we will get to a point where the physical limitations of what we've got are exhausted. Having said that, we've still got capacity on the two runways. We've still got some capacity on our airfield. We've just found another space where we can put another 14 aircraft stands, which is helpful. Passenger processing is, is clearly something that we're forensically um, investing in the technology to, uh, to achieve the input um, efficiencies we need. But ultimately, when we run out, we will need a new airport, and that will have to be of at least 150 million passengers right from the initial start, because if we're going to migrate away from DXB, which is already the world's largest international airport, we're going to have to have something of equivalent size and scope. So that's going to be a challenge. And how easy is it dealing with the authorities when you need to undertake a big expansion like that? Well, the thing is, you see, the, the, the big threshold that I think we've got to work out is, is the costs of it. Um, unfortunately, I think in other jurisdictions, the politics, the infrastructure, the planning authority, the regulation, all of those massive bureaucratic hurdles, we fortunately do not have to encounter because there is a symbiotic relationship between the government and the airport because the government understands how important the airport is to the economy and the question of, you know, which is more important, the airport or the city, it's a bit like saying, which is more important, your heart or your lungs? The answer is, without it, you can't function. And the city and airport, I think, have equal uh, prominence when it comes to looking at GDP. So we don't have that problem in convincing the government. The government are absolutely behind us in terms of knowing that tourism, travel, commerce are all enabled by the airport. So it's, that challenge, I think, is going to be probably a financial and logistical one rather than a political or um, planning issue. 
I mean, geographically, you tick all the boxes. Mm. Who are your main competitors? Well, we are ideally geographically placed. I think we've got something like uh, one third of the world's population within a four hour flight window and two thirds between, within an eight hour flight window. Um, airports are quite specific to location. So I wouldn't say we have direct competitors. However, the transfer market is highly competitive. And obviously we do look at our market share of transfer traffic quite carefully. And although the predominance of point-to-point -point at our scale is, is impressive, nevertheless, the transfer markets are important. And uh, we look at you know, what's happening in, in Qatar, we look at what's happening in Turkey, we look down the road in Abu Dhabi. But again, I think you know, the good thing about the region is that the travel and tourism potential of the Middle East is absolutely enormous. And I think a bit like travel and tourism has developed in Europe, you know, Long-haul travellers, say from America and Japan, have, have never visited just one country in Europe. They've always you know, gone to London and, and to Paris and to, to Frankfurt, to Rome, to Milan, etc. Um, and I think visitors to the Middle East, if they've got more travel and tourism options, will come to the Middle East in greater numbers. So I, I think increases in capacity in airports and airlines in the region is actually a very good thing. We saw during the 2022 uh, Qatar World Cup a huge influx at our airport DWC down the road where we had a shuttle service between uh, Doha and, and Dubai. We saw in the last quarter during the World Cup at the influx of 465,000 people through the airport that were coming to Dubai, going to the match and coming back. So that sort of relationship, I think, will exist with our neighbours in Saudi and other areas around the region. So I think competition is actually, in this case, going to stimulate far greater growth than it means dividing the existing market between existing players. So I think it's going to be a good thing. Yeah, you are based in a, um, a, a, a polluting um, part of the world in terms of um, gas guzzlers. And, uh, but obviously, in the aviation industry, sustainability is a hot topic. What are you doing to improve sustainability at your airports? Well, I think the first thing, look, you know, um, I don't think you can characterize the Middle East as a sort of net emitter um, uh, by design. I mean, what we are now doing is focusing on the huge benefits of green renewable energy. There's a massive solar park, the Mohammed bin Rashid Solar Park in Dubai, which is one of the largest in the world. And the actual proportion of solar energy we're using as part of the power for the country is actually a lot higher than it is in a lot of other countries. We're also looking at um, the sustainable aviation fuel challenge. And I was actually very encouraged to see the moves made by Singapore to put a levy on all of the um, flights so that the uh, investment in SAF can be accelerated. I think that's a very positive move and I applaud them for doing that. And it's about $12, I think, on a, uh, a long-haul flight, 12 US dollars. And if you think about that, what that can do across the whole piece is allow the consumer to help fund the industry's transition to sustainable fuel, which I think is a very good thing. Um, on the ground, where it's easier to mitigate, we're investing very heavily in uh, increasing by a tenfold amount our solar power productivity. We've just signed a deal where we're going to put uh, PV generating uh, equipment on every single rooftop throughout the airport. We are in active transition to electric vehicles across all of our operations. And our aim within very short space of time is not to issue any further airside permits to any form of vehicular transport that isn't powered by renewables or uh, some form of green technology. I and mean, it's a bit of a challenge because, you know, the, the mobility of airport vehicles means that they're not actually stable for in, in the static in one place for very long. So we have to look at that as a challenge, but we're doing everything we can. We're aiming to send zero waste to landfill. We're aiming to do all sorts of things to uh, mitigate a carbon footprint. Our target within three years is a 36% reduction. So we've got some very positive plans. And briefly, because we are running out of time, um, 
Do you see Dubai, Dubai airports trying to implement a tax like Singapore has done? A little bit early to second judge UA government policy. I wouldn't be so bold as to do that, but I think it's a great initiative. I've actually suggested for some time that the sustainability challenge cannot be taken on the shoulders of any one party. It needs the triumvirate of industry to invest, uh, governments to mandate and consumers to help to fund. So uh, Singapore taking this proactive step to actually kick off that triumvirate, I think is a very positive step. And I hope that other countries will follow. We have to solve this sustainability problem. It will be achieved by modal shift. It will be achieved by a multiplicity of different initiatives, but actually, ultimately, the consumer is going to have to bear the cost of mitigating the carbon footprints, not just in aviation, but of every good and service we consume. So it's a very positive move. Nice to end on a positive note. And I hope those positive um, ambitions play out in the future. Paul Griffith, CEO of Dubai Airports, many thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you.